Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, introducing this uh, wonderful new series, uh, uh, The Architecture of Place, uh, collaboration between the ICAA, Intbau, and the Princess Foundation. Uh, this series of talks is a collaboration between these three organizations and focuses on the uh, built environment and its impact on the health of individuals, communities, and the planet. Uh, established and emerging voices will speak on their work uh, to create a better built future, something we can all look forward to. It's my great pleasure to introduce lecture number one. The title is The Architecture of Place, Florida, Atlanta, and Al Ain with Scott Merrill. Uh, the lecture is a series of case studies of eight projects, four in Florida, one in Southwest Atlanta, three in the Arabian Peninsula. The talk focuses on the tensions between local forces that influence design, such as climate, proximity materials, uh, local culture, skills of the labor force, and the larger forces on the regional, national, and global scales. Uh, it addresses how architects can balance local, regional, international influences without sacrificing local character. Uh, it will emphasize the idea that we do not need to choose between these two, that both are part of our common inheritance and that to ask people to choose only has the effect of making our inheritance smaller and more impoverished. Finally, we'll discuss how architects can use both local and remote traditions to practice successfully in regions outside of their own locality and region. Scott Merrill received his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Virginia and a Master of Architecture degree from Yale University. In 1990, he opened a solo practice in Vero Beach, Florida, which has now become Merrill, Pastor, and Colgan Architects, where he is the principal designer. His work has been recognized 14 times by the Florida AIA and three times by the National AIA. In 2004, Merrill and Pastor Architects was given the Arthur Ross Award by the Institute of Classical Architecture. In 2012, he was awarded the Seaside Prize, and in 2016, the University of Notre Dame School of Architecture awarded Scott the Richard H. Driehaus Prize. Without further ado, uh, present Scott Merrill. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to the ICAA and to INPAL and to the Prince's Foundation for sponsoring this lecture series. I will speak for about 15 minutes and then start a slideshow, which will last about 45 minutes, and we'll take questions at the end. I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. The ICAA has asked me to speak on the topic of the architecture of place, and the talk is entitled Inventing Florida, Atlanta, and Alain. The ICA is producing a superb series of old and new regional architecture in the United States in California, Chicago, the South, and soon Florida. But the architecture of place is a very large topic. It's elusive and it's subtle. And the phrase is invariably used earnestly and in good faith, but I think that everybody means something slightly different. And trying to fix its meaning is like trying to stick a pin in a ball of mercury. As soon as you stab at it, it shatters into pieces and it skitters out of your reach. So we all believe in regionalism and we travel to find and enjoy regional differences. But we also presume many of us to work outside of our region where our footing is less assured. One project I'll show you is a master plan for an army fort in Atlanta, which I work closely with Ben Bolgar of the Princess Foundation. And another presumes to attract Emirates back to the center of Alain. So is this arrogant? And is it antithetical to regionalism? And are we interlopers? My talk will focus on what standing or authority we have when we work in someone else's backyards and whether people are right to resist it. And instead of talking about the quality of places with discernible traditions, I decided to talk about places that have no discernible traditions or few traditions or lapsed traditions or promising but undeveloped traditions or traditions unequal to modern problems. Places that to varying degrees have to be invented just about every day. I work a lot in places like this. They can be inelegant scrums, they can be circuses, and for sure you have to put up sometimes with carnival barkers and grifters. But they can also be exhilarating places to work. Vacuums attract influences from far and wide, and so you have to sort through which ones offer something genuinely interesting to a place, 
and which ones only result in more of a dispiriting sense of dislocation. While it's never enough, one way in which we try and understand the world is by taking our experience and flinging it outward as far as possible. And so I'll start with Florida and the projects that I know the best. Liz Platter Zyberg and Andreas Duwani wrote an important essay on Florida in 1991. And they said they considered the Mediterranean and the Caribbean to be two shores of the same sea. And I would say that even for those who are wary of globalizing forces, I think we can agree that this is not a scary way of thinking of our common inheritance. They also said that there were three irreducible traditions in Florida, the Mediterranean, the modern of Miami Beach, and the cracker. Two of these are cosmopolitan influences. Miami Beach looked like contemporary Tel Aviv or Casablanca or even Baku. And the third is proudly rooted and provincial. Their point was that we don't have to choose between them. They all belong to us and we will use them to greater or to lesser effect. In the 1980s, Florida, in a flush of wealth, took the Mediterranean revival, which I think is a sweet affecting rustic tradition that was of great interest in Florida in the 1920s. And we pumped it up to a grotesque scale and we added classical accretions to ever diminishing effects. And of course, this was regrettable. 100 years earlier, Carrera and Hastings designed Henry Flagler's ridiculously ambitious Ponce de Leon Hotel in uh, St. Augustine. Their first large building, it was stuffed full of way, way too many ideas from the architect's travels in Spain. However, I'm very fond of that building. And I wonder what determines when something affecting crosses the line into something grotesque. The most inventive Florida ideas almost invariably come from interlopers who presume to tell us what Florida might look like. We welcome New Yorkers and we welcome Ohio oil men and we afford them the chance to do what they can't do at home, which is to settle entire coasts and to invent entire towns like Palm Beach or Miami Beach. George Merrick came from Pittsburgh. Phineas Paste came from Philadelphia. Meisner's father was a diplomat in Central America. Paul Rudolph came from Alabama via GSD in the Navy. Marion Manley came from Kansas. Henry Clouseau came to Jacksonville after a devastating fire there in 1901. He was from Illinois. He was a few years younger than Frank Lloyd Wright. And he brought the broad overhangs of the prairie style to Jacksonville where they made a lot of sense. It's not remarkable that he would try this. It seems remarkable that no one has taken it further. While far-flung influences take hold rather quickly, endearing regional differences tend to wither slowly and for a number of fairly benign reasons. When my wife and I moved to Florida, there was a line below which there were no good carpenters and above which there were no good masons. There are still no good carpenters in Miami, but there are now reasonably good masons in the panhandle. This affords more choices to people who live in the panhandle, but the wooden cracker traditions that the panhandle embraced 30 years ago have tended to recede a little bit. And there are still small but interesting cultural shifts that are easy to miss. When Southern Shelter magazines, historically the engines of provincial traditions, start talking about being edgy, you sense a boredom or an embarrassment with what is close at hand and familiar. And I see this everywhere. It's a small example, but when we first moved to the Panhandle, people took immense pride in not using palm trees to charm Northerners, as South Florida did so ostentatiously. As a Northerner, I liked that, and especially the attitude and the pride that it reflected. Now people use palm trees freely and without embarrassment, and Miamians have concluded that palm trees provide no relief from the sun and have embraced the live oaks so common in the Panhandle. So I'm fine with this. It even seems a little bit funny to me. But lots of things like this make a muddle of what it means to love a place. Now the barrier islands, low rolling sandbars on which people historically had the good sense not to build, are more or less forced to draw from other places. So think of Seaside's recourse to New Orleans row houses, to shotguns, Creole cottages and Middle South dog trots, or to Charleston side yard houses. Alice Beach improbably combined Central American planning with Bermudan architecture. Town architects Eric Vogt and Marianne Curry Vogt then overlaid their love of North Africa. The mix of traditions at Alice is exciting, but it is also a high wire act. And unless skilled hands, it would be a disaster. 
As projects like Rosemary Beach or Seaside or Alice develop over the years, architects get bored and they overwork the most serene and dignified languages. At some point, exhilarating cross-pollinizing shades into something less meaningful and authoritative. But as I asked earlier, at what point exactly? It's probably our job to at least think about it. If you travel the eight miles of Florida's County Road 30A between Seaside and Rosemary Beach, you can sort of see the logical end of it all. Curacao next to Bermuda and Morocco and St. Augustine and Venice and Charleston and New Orleans and Nantucket. In a vacuum, we have to know where to start. We have to know when to stop. We don't just submit to large homogenizing forces that wash over us. We're conscious actors. We shape these forces. We have lots of choices and we bear the responsibility for what we do with them. We need to be grateful for our abundant inheritance, but we should not be overly deferential. Florida's traditions were developed by people very much like ourselves and fairly recently. The architecture of place is an inherently conservative, though it can be, just as often it demands changes and improvements and a constructive impatience with what exists. Jefferson in designing the lawn at UVA looked past Tidewater, Virginia to Paris and Rome. And sometimes we require the imagination of all those interlopers and the carpet baggers to see what could exist but doesn't exist yet. And of course, I feel a little bit presumptuous when I work in other people's backyards, but I also know what outsiders have contributed greatly to the invention of Florida. This year's Driehaus winner went to school in the United States and practices in Thailand. The prize has previously recognized a French couple who did a mosque in the Netherlands, a Spanish architect who like Spain itself has worked with North African and Mediterranean influences, a Luxembourger and a Miami couple of Polish and Cuban descent who have had such an outsized influence on their many American admirers in a small town in the panhandle of Florida. And I think of all this when I work in other places. The architecture of place is not among our most pressing concerns right now. But what we love about a place, what we save, what we protect, what we foster and cultivate, what we elevate, what we ruin with excess, what bores us, what embarrasses us, what we take pride in, what we inherit, what we invent, what we submit to, what we rebel against, and what we assimilate all seem worth thinking about and arguing about. I will go to slides. I will start with projects from Florida and I will do a large master planning project in Atlanta and I will conclude with projects from the Middle East and I'm going to apologize in advance for moving so briskly. This is Seaside as you approach it from Alabama. I'll use the example of the Seaside Chapel which is in the foreground here to talk about mixing high and low traditions. There was an Episcopal bishop in Alabama who encouraged the rural congregations in his wooded state to build in the board and Baton language. This influence seemed to peak in North and Central Florida in about the 1880s. This chapel descends in part from this very affecting rural tradition. However, it also descends from seaside guidelines that allow only public buildings to have recourse to classical architecture. This is not an American tradition. Lots of American houses and commercial buildings are classical, of course. But when DPC wrote the guidelines in the early 80s, public programs most everywhere were enervated. And so I understand their experiment as a means of giving modest public buildings more relative presence. The chapel might best be thought of then as a mix of high and low traditions. Classicism monumentalizes the rural vernacular on a prominent site surrounded by large houses, and the vernacular board in Baton pulls monumental classicism back from the brink of imperiousness and self-importance. The chapel is in a hurricane zone and tall embraced walls take immense lateral loads. This is expressed inside and out by the structural hierarchy, which is based on contributing areas. This is the chapel as it faces the town and the woods. The chapel is pulled forward like St. Philip's Church on Church Street in Charleston it's bell tower prominent as you approach from the east on Forest Street. This is not an Episcopal church. It's a non-denominational chapel that has to look evidently like a place of worship, but like no particular place of worship. This is an aerial view showing Seaside and Windsor and Vero Beach. 
Windsor's contribution to Florida architecture is his revival of the courtyard, which is a tradition that was extinguished by Florida's land bust of the 1920s. Its contribution to planning is the picturesque grid, small blocks, and a high percentage of corner lots. This high ratio of street frontage to the developable area of land is luxurious, but it is expensive, like the plan of Savannah. This is a small classical precinct at the entrance to the village of 150 houses on which five roads converge. The climate is unforgiving and Vero Beach is a provincial town. And so it's been fun thinking about how classicism might give expression to these considerations. There are always more important sites than important programs. And when a public program is innervated, you can press private buildings into service like this apartment building. The porch is overscaled so that it can be seen from a distance on approach from two blocks away. The atrium pulls air through the building, but legally it's also a dedicated public element on the path from the village to the sea. And I will show more examples of private buildings serving public purposes later. This is a vehicular gate to the village on the right, seen from the east and then from the southwest where the tower plays off the lower building in the foreground. George Merrick, in developing Coral Gables in the 1920s, used the defensive type of the gate to ennoble passage into the city. And the Windsor Gate descends from Merrick's generous impulses. The climate in Vero Beach is indifferent to refinement and the architecture reflects some wariness of high traditions. The post office on the left is an archaic subtropical temple. The boxes on the lower level are lit by the Clara stories, which are in turn shaded by broad eaves. The colonnade on the right has primitive columns expressing both compression and tension as the columns actually hold buildings down in hurricanes. The extended caps also refer to the citrus trees for which the county was once famous. This is about a mile south of Windsor. The term condominium describes a form of multifamily ownership with common elements. It's a technical term. But the toxic effect of condos on Florida has made the word slur. These condos on the ocean and the Indian River exhibit a sort of forceful financial logic and inert site planning that produces an extreme form of dislocation. People who live here can live almost anywhere they choose. It's amazing that the market doesn't afford more choices and even more amazing that consumers don't revolt. These condos on the perimeter of Windsor and on the edge of the archipelago of the Indian River are part of an ongoing effort to reform a type that's critical to urban programs in Florida. I'll show three examples. This first shows the project in a larger setting on the river side of the barrier island at the northwest corner of Windsor and on a small park. The value is inordinately towards the river. The urban obligation is inordinately towards the park and away from the view. And so the first job is to reconcile these two things. This is a high view from over the green and toward the river. I wanted these buildings to reflect the generosity of garden apartment buildings from 100 years ago, only with the requisite garages and two means of egress. You can see two auto courts here hidden from the park. This is a hovering view from over the mangroves towards the main courtyard. The buildings face the county's first national wildlife refuge, which is Pelican Island, which was dedicated and set aside by Teddy Roosevelt. The narrow ends of the buildings face the green in order to minimize the scale of the buildings as the green is shared also by single family residences. You move from the street through a paved forecourt, through a small planted courtyard beneath the central building and into the semi-public space on the river. And these views are from the riverside. Most valuable views of condos are usually from the upper floors. And this almost invariably means that the floor plates are extruded and you get very dull roof lines. In this case, I used a fair amount of political capital to reduce the upper floors in an attempt to bury the roof line. Back to the panhandle here. This is the main space at Alice Beach. I'm gonna show another condominium, but one as simple and as compact and as efficient as the ones I criticized a moment ago. Alice has for years focused on residential lots and we know Alice mostly for its small intimate scale and for highly articulated volumes. This project, only the second large building is different. I wanted to do an extremely simple 
volume that would have presence in a larger setting. This is a mixed use building with residences over a restaurant and the shutters control harsh west light on the continuous porches. These are some of the precedents, the Cherokee apartments in LA, there are apartments in Madrid, I think with bamboo shutters. And then there's the Brill Hart house in Miami that recalls hovering Sarasota houses. This shows the ground floor and the upper floor plans. All rooms access the porch directly, and there's a high percentage of corner units with three exposures. On the ground floor, there's always the problem of how to make a lobby prominent without eviscerating the retail frontage. In this case, they wanted a continuous restaurant frontage, and so the lobby is around the corner. This compares the amphitheater and the mid-block elevations in the context of the wide 130-foot right-of-way. These are views of the mid-block elevation from County Road 30A and from the east along the slip lane. Corey Vogt's beautiful one-story liner building is in the foreground providing what we normally don't get, which is an instant setting. And here, one of a million ways to configure the facade based on weather, time of day, and occupancy. These shutters also hide privacy walls between the porches. Balconies and porches are often the hardest elements to solve for a multifamily. And then these two condominium buildings, one block south of the public plaza on the Gulf of Mexico will break ground this fall. They will face the recently completed Beach Club by Hart Howerton, who also designed the raised plaza. Like the condos at Windsor, these buildings face both the town and a sensitive natural environment. This is the building facing the town. These buildings are the same plate size as the ones I criticized earlier. Neither the simple forms nor the foundation financial logic of the type present a challenge to good urban settings. This is the building facing the Gulf of Mexico. The principal challenge here was to reconcile the low percentage of glass that characterizes the town with the high percentage of glass expected on the Gulf front. Even if they default to certain plan solutions, condominiums can be as varied as their settings. Now we'll switch to Atlanta. This is a 145 acre master plan for a decommissioned army post just inside the city limits of Atlanta and three miles south of the downtown. It's along a MARTA track and there are stops at each end of the property. We work with Ben Bolgar of the Princess Foundation with Stephen McCauley, the master developer, and with Brian Hooker of the Fort Mac LRA. We had unstanding support from Atlanta's planning and zoning departments as well. The Fort property is a verdant site with a scattering of Fort buildings. We incorporated historic buildings. Of course, we worked with the topography, but the city wants people on this site so close to transit, and that will transform the site. And this only increases the responsibility of those who presume to build here. The MARTA tracks are on the right. The darker buildings are those that we designed and master planned. The property is very irregular. There are out parcels for a VA hospital and the large secure force comb building. Previous land deals sold off the interior, including the magnificent parade ground to a movie studio. We plan two miles of frontages on the east and the north edges of the property. Most of the square footage is in the 60 acre market district at the bottom and near the MARTA station. These diagrams show the pedestrian path from the MARTA station and through the market district. Their public and semi-public spaces are evenly distributed throughout the district. The market square, just the other side of the foreground building, is the same size as Madison Square in Savannah. No one has invested in Southwest Atlanta for decades. The closing of the fort brought the loss of 7,000 jobs. The housing has to be efficient and cost effective, but the walk up the hill from the MARTA station and through the market district was designed to afford the greatest possible variety and richness for residents. Plus Furstenberg in Paris is only 70 feet on a side. We provided for innumerable semi-public mid-block spaces this size as the red circles in the lower left indicate. We had to provide for on-site stormwater storage and even the densest areas. This shows both hard storage and soft storage. This is like the mill ponds of New England towns where my wife grew up, which can create such beautiful settings. These views show the scale of the market district, the edge on the right, and there's senior housing at the pinwheel on the rise in the distance. 
there are no parking requirements in the city of Atlanta. And in what I think is a very nice turn, developers balk at this extreme form of deregulation and they end up insisting on fairly conventional parking capacity. Less than 25% of the parking can be accommodated on the street. Atlanta has a lot of Texas donuts. If you don't know the phrase housing around structured parking. It is a large dismal type that can be improved on the margins until it's finally ushered from the stage. This is the widest street at 100 feet with a relatively small travel lane with a multi-purpose trail and a linear park on the left. This shows the juncture of the market district and the historic district. This is one of only two signaled intersections and will carry traffic from patients at the VA hospital to the frontage road. The multi-use trail was very important to the programming as Atlanta's 22 mile belt line around the city is a development engine right now. In this part of the site, it has to thread between old buildings and new buildings, played very casually through the site. Buildings in purple exist, buildings in green are proposed, and integrating them was a fun challenge. A precedent for the trail through this part of the site was the one and a quarter mile series of seven linear parks that the Olmstead firm strung together in Druid Hills on the east side of Atlanta. It's sort of a less well-known version of the Emerald Necklace. They use similar spaces to great effect in Atlanta's hillier Ainsley Park as well. This is more stormwater storage, part of the continuous green spaces up at the attenuated Big Bend at the northeast corner of the property. The curved building is like the Crescent buildings of South Kensington. Our version has a mix of flats and townhouses within a single building. The city planning office asked us to provide for more housing types than is currently afforded by the market. Double loaded halls will be necessary in many buildings. And so we stress models with simple, efficient envelopes and a higher percentage of glass. And we stressed for going a little bit of rental income to let light into the corridor at the elevator. Atlanta has a decent mill tradition and they provide one kind of large plate precedent for high percentages of glass. American dormitories seem like good models. They have efficient volumes, they have plans with multiple stairwells, and they have good percentages of glass. Atlanta developers will spend a fortune to avoid simple repetitive elevations like this one. And they recover the costs of the small ins and outs by using mean windows. And I think this aversion to simplicity and repetition is demand driven and not supply driven and should be addressed culturally. Early London County Council housing has a stolid repetitive efficiency of American dorms and the capacity to make great urban spaces. We provided innumerable gates along the property's two mile frontage. This is the principal north gate of the fort. There are good examples of using private buildings as gates. I showed the apartment building at Windsor earlier. On the left, this is Marco Rettenhoa in Essen, Germany, and on the right, Torty Gallus' apartments on Connecticut Avenue in Washington that provide a glimpse of Rock Creek Park beyond. The plan in the upper right shows three entrances in red along Campbellton Road. Every entrance to the site for two miles was designed to be ennobling. MARTA, which is the rapid transit in Atlanta, MARTA has proposed its first new initiative in 20 years along the property's north edge. Atlanta was once a big streetcar town these are all new commercial buildings on a widened right of way on Campbellton Road. These are views of senior housing, typically isolated, but here integrated into a small plaza and into the landscape. Construction on these programs is usually pretty cheap, and so the site planning has to be rich. This is a pinwheel from the east and from the west. Pinwheels tend to break up long stretches of streets, and they're fun to enter from any direction. They can be the locus of adjacent blocks, very much like a small neighborhood park. There wasn't enough land for a traditional school because of the extravagant requirements of the athletic program. So we made the fields a public space fronted by housing. The space is the same size as Jefferson's lawn, 200 by 600 feet and terracing down the hillside. No one was interested in the fort three years ago, but this master plan got it rezoned to densities and coverages comparable to Midtown. 
and the opportunity zones that were provided for in the 2017 Tax Act added further to the fort's value. And so now it will be fought over. Place includes politics. And at Fort McPherson, place pushed back. Likely none of this will be built. On to the Middle East. Alain is the UAE's fourth largest city, and it sees itself in contrast to Dubai and Abu Dhabi as the traditional city of the UAE. But the satellite image on the right from around 1970 shows a 4,000 year old trading outpost as it's being raised for a new city with half mile long super blocks and boulevards that are wider than the Champs Elysees. Look for the giant traffic circles. The dark area is the oasis that you see in the photos on the left. A team led by DPZ was tasked with attracting Emiratis back to the city center, even as they were being given birthright lots on the edges of the city in the desert, what you see in the lower center. Top center are two 40 acre super blocks for which we did more detailed plans conforming with DPZ's guidelines. One block is overlaid in bottom right on the walled city of Dubrovnik in order to highlight how underused its interior is right now. Bottom left is a photo of the middle of the other block, largely empty, though there are three existing mosques. Upper right is a boulevard whose trees are watered with desalinated water that's brought from 70 miles away. The mosques and the repetitive five story block liners will remain. Our focus was the smaller block interiors of three stories. As I recall, it's about 1,900 units within the perimeter of this block. And here, an aerial and an eye level of the central plaza. The city wanted all development parcels to self-park, but they also wanted to maintain the scale of the perimeter buildings that used on-street parking. It was impossible for us to honor both. The new parcels are based on 20-meter increments, equivalent to parking aisles, and the scale is broken down as much as possible. The second super block, the one that was overlaid on Dubrovnik is also about 40 acres. We developed the block interior based on DPZ guidelines and we developed a high speed rail station, which is on red on the left to connect Alain, Abu Dhabi and Dubai. It's a simple building based on two types of precedents, the top lighting of Trajan's market and the ad hoc wooden street covering shown in this view from David Roberts lithograph series of Cairo. This is a view from the boulevard at dusk and a view of the interior. It's like a covered street between identical buildings. 12 years later, these blocks remain substantially the same. And regardless, working in Alain remains one of the most rewarding professional experiences that I've had. This was a two week competition with DPZ. The site in red is between the Jeddah airport and the Red Sea on the left. The scale is a lot larger than Alain DPZ provided for a pedestrian street that rose over parking towards the elevated main plaza. Our plan is on the right and the roof plan is inserted into the master plan on the left. The view here on the left, indicated by a red arrow on the plan, is over one of the two hotel sites and looking up the pedestrian street as it rises and narrows and enters the main plaza at an angle in the distance. This shows the main plaza overlaid on spaces that you're more familiar with. This is the other hotel on the broad side of the central space. The arcade of the Stockholm City Hall that separates the courtyard from the waterfront is a device that could be used in many more places to connect public and semi-public spaces and even to improve air movement in hot climates. This is another comparison to help describe the scale of the building and the space. The value of the land required six to seven stories. Parking is underground as it is at Kayala in Guatemala. 18 meter buildings form 75 meter blocks. And finally, Mecca. This master plan by DPZ is at the gate to Mecca on the highway from Jeddah. This shows the first phase designed by a team of firms that include Walter Chatham, Martinez and Alvarez and Michael Ember. Our buildings are circled. A primary challenge, as in Jetta, was gigantism. Streets are enormous and alleys often afford the nicest scale. This is a view of the largest building from the alley. There's a ramp to subgrade parking in the foreground. One means of mitigating 
gigantism is modeling the building. The limits on this tool are the cumulative number of required elevators and exit stairs. This building has two cores. These are adjacent H and C-shaped buildings from both the boulevard and from the alleyway. Red lines outline the apartments on the floor of the H-shaped building. And these are some elevation studies. This smaller transitional building has at-grade parking off of an alleyway, and it has a raised courtyard. The side setbacks are only two meters, so the better exposures for rear units are to the courtyards. This problem is common in Miami Beach as well, a couple blocks off the ocean. This is where the building type might actually work well. So this is the end of the work that I have to show you. And in wrapping things up, I think I ought to at least try to answer my own questions. I don't have a good record of getting things built far afield. And while it's certainly conceivable, I don't think we're interlopers when we work in other people's backyards. I don't think it's arrogant to try I think we often bring the sense of possibility that somebody brought to Florida from other places. Very quickly, you do encounter things you wish you understood better. Very quickly, you wish you had more and better relationships with people. But those who bring you to some place are tolerant and forgiving of these things. But projects fall apart for a thousand reasons and never the same one twice. Design is hard, but stewardship of a design is harder. And it's in stewardship that I think place pushes back the hardest. The most successful projects I know have a key person on site. Stewardship, keeping things from falling apart, takes so much time and so much energy, and there's still no substitute for being there. And while that may not be how we think of the architecture of place, I think that it's during this phase of stewardship when place probably matters the most. Thank you, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Scott, um, for a wonderful presentation. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, the first question, I imagine that the building in Alice Beach was more expensive than usual given the great number of shutters for a building of this scale. Did you get any developer pushback on that feature? Alice Beach is a rarefied place. It's relatively expensive to build in Alice Beach, but I think everyone considered the shutters uh, for what they cost to be worth uh, the money. But I, yes, obviously Alice Beach is a rarefied environment. In your view, what could be the place of vernacular building materials in attempting to create local character in buildings today? I was trying to describe in the intro, one example of a process where materials were actually becoming more uniform. So I gave the example of masonry being common to just one part of Florida, whereas it's quite common everywhere now. And um, aside from our intent and our wishes to use local building materials, it's probably not going to happen just because we wish it would be so. We find that we're bringing assemblies and materials from great distances. So for example, we use a lot of Western red cedar for exterior um, carpentry on most of our buildings in Florida and there's not remotely a source of that. I mean, that's coming either from Canada or from the Pacific Northwest in our country. Uh, windows come from all over the place. Uh, the ones that don't come from overseas will usually come from the upper Midwest. Wisconsin has a lot of them. Block and concrete is very local. Almost everything else is not very local and can come from a great distance. The next question, he says, hi, Scott, great talk. Uh, you had the courage, it seems, um, to not only work with local traditions in massing, color palette, materials, et cetera, but also in ornamentation. Is the culturally specific nature of ornamental meaning particularly hard to deal with or is geometry universal? No, I mean, I gave you the example. One of them is of the citrus trees, for example. Um, we probably don't use a whole lot of symbolism, but it's not that difficult to deal with when we do use it. One question I had, if you could speak um, slightly more on some of the climate differences between um, the three locations you spoke on and particular changes you've had to make to the design philosophy because of those. Well, one of the things that I was trying to describe in the Vero Beach projects is also true of things in the panhandle. I mean, we often talk about Florida as being monolithic. It's not, there's a lot of great differences, but the climate is pretty brutal throughout the length of the peninsula. So. Increasingly, I think that narrows the choice. First of all, when you build in Florida and in a brutal environment, it seems like you attract a lot of attention from 
lawyers and uh, lawsuits. And so I find that you tend to build fairly defensively in a really brutal environment. And I know this is probably not the answer that people want to hear, but lawsuits are so common, you tend to rely more on things that are um, defendable and you probably narrow your choices. And I think that's a regrettable aspect, but it's a little bit hard to ignore. Right. I also spoke about condominiums for three different projects without mentioning the fact that they also attract a great deal of litigation. And so one of the overlays, and it's kind of a drag to talk about it, but one of the overlays is that condominiums, despite my efforts to try and reform the building type, um, have other problems which have to do with the legal environment. And so, I mean, I have to say that when you start talking about regionalism and local materials and all these things, there are things that impinge on architecture like insurance requirements or lawsuits that actually have real effects on what kinds of materials and systems and projects that you can use. So I didn't talk about that a lot, as I said, because it's kind of a drag. Um, next question. Um, the three cities you presented are all quite low rise and widespread. Did you attempt making the city's urban fabric any denser and more walkable at a neighborhood scale with the projects you presented? Let's say that Jetta is an aberration and because it didn't happen. But if you want to take the Atlanta project, I would say that by most standards, that's a fairly dense uh, district, particularly in the market district. Here's another thing that I didn't talk about, which also bears on, let's say, density. There's reasons why I didn't talk about this a lot, but um, the type of construction that you have to use in terms of the building code is actually quite inexpensive and I would say unsatisfying. And so the density and the height, well, let's say density is a combination of coverage and height. The height is limited in a place like um, Atlanta by what you're allowed to do with type five construction. And so no, it's really not up to me to have greater density there. We did get it zoned for 150 foot tall buildings, which is probably at least twice, if not two and a half times as tall as the buildings that we actually designed for. But um, increasing the allowable height, for example, has to do with more things than just what our wishes are. Um, another question on climate comes in. He specifically says, um, can you quickly speak to your experiences in dealing with the environmental constraints in the U.S. that might have shaped your approach to buildings in the Middle East? They're really very different. I mean, Florida is moist. Humidity is a problem. And actually, I think of buildings that basically start to deteriorate from moisture almost the day they open. And that's not a problem in the Middle East. You know, sometimes even latitudes aren't transferable. So... No, I'm not sure that there's a lot in terms of the environment that is transferable from my experience in Florida to the Middle East. You saw lots of date palms in the slides. Date palms also come from a very dry climate and then we bring them into a wet climate. So that in itself, I think is kind of weird. Tom has a question. He says, Scott, beautiful work as always. New South boom towns like Atlanta are a tough place to design quality or quantity. Um, the way you break down the massing and scale and adjust the shortcomings of building types like the Texas Donut. Your designs incorporating natural daylight and cross ventilation in ways developers don't usually think about in consideration of the pandemic. Can you talk more about reforming these stale building types? Well, with regard to the pandemic, it seems like the timeline for building is pretty long. And I'm not as convinced as other people are that COVID is going to have a huge effect on how we build. I'm not sure yet how that's going to affect how we do urban districts. And this may not be exactly what the question was about, but it does remind me of something that I didn't have a chance to talk about with Atlanta, which I think is a really interesting issue. And if you don't mind, I'll use the pretext of the question to address this. So one of the really interesting questions that Ben and I batted back and forth was the question of the quality of the buildings. I told you that we were limited by stick frame construction. And it's not a particularly great form of building large buildings, but um, Atlanta developers are limited to relatively cheap construction because if they step out of line and have higher upfront costs, they'll get kind of slaughtered in the market. And Ben Bolgar was very good to put 
to me, but especially to the master developer, the question of why they couldn't have higher upfront costs and have buildings that after say 25 years were an asset rather than a completely written down building. I mean, I think this is probably one of the most interesting questions that the Atlanta project raises. Um, it was never resolved because I think that you can't act unilaterally in a market like uh, Atlanta. Marianne Cusada, who I believe to speak in your series later, um, will probably be able to speak to this issue because I've spoken with her about it recently. I think this question about durability and quality and whether the buildings in a project like the Atlanta project could be better constructed and whether or not you could have more upfront costs and an asset after a certain short period of time is probably the more important question about what form these districts take. The next question comes in, um, thanks for your presentation. I was wondering what your general approach in designing is. What is your starting point when you're designing? Again, if you go to the Atlanta project, the place where the vast majority of the square footage is will get completely transformed, basically going to level the site. And then you'll have these, um, I won't say featureless because the site's still beautiful, but the site won't be as much of a consideration. On the other hand, large portions of that site and other sites where the site itself is so distinct and has such distinct characteristics that that becomes the first thing that you think about. So it could be the steepness of the hillside. It could be um, the water table. It could be uh, stormwater storage. I mean, these are the things that you often think about first. You also have a brief. And in the case of the Atlanta project, while the developer's sort of with his requirements at first, you know that he's got a certain amount of program that he has to get on the site. And so there will be certain expectations about density and total square footage. Those things are pretty much front loaded. Um, how far do you research or allow a local culture to inform a design? Um, she says, I see you have a book on Islam. Was that for when you were building in Mecca? I have a whole bookcase on Islamic architecture. So I think this question gets to really the question of the lecture, which is what can you know about other places where you presume to build? I mean, I think one of the things that I was trying to say is that there are strict limits to what you can know. In terms of the amount of research, maybe it would help to give you an example of the kind of thing that I wish I knew more about, just as an example. So I wish I knew a little bit more about the relationship of religion and the real estate market in the Middle East and what that has to do with the preference for the different types of parcels that you can have. I noticed that in the Middle East, there is a preference for uniform parcels and plans that tend to look like Roman camps. And so you wish you knew more about what religion had to do with that and the prescription of selling real estate. And there's probably a thousand examples like that. So I think more in terms of the limits of the research that you can do than I think about the amount of research that you can do. When you emphasize what you've not been able to learn, there's a certain um, humility, which is why I think you're not fundamentally arrogant when you try and work in other people's backyards. Andreas Dewani constantly says that he's always faced with the fact that he's not as familiar with a place as the people who are asking him questions. But he says that my expertise is what should take place in 30 years. And I think that's a pretty good position to take that you'll never be an expert in the place that you presume to work. Another question here, was there any public participation in the projects you worked on? If so, what elements were the stakeholders most interested in or concerned with? Well, I mean, we've worked as part of a team with DPZ and most of the projects that I showed, our firm headed up the effort in Atlanta. And I'm a little bit more familiar with that. The town that I live in has incredibly rancorous public meetings and I've been kind of accustomed to that and got used to it. The public input process in Atlanta was incredibly civilized by contrast. The other thing is that they've been trying to develop that fort property since the base closed. And the first efforts to redevelop it occurred around 2007, 2008. And of course they were scuttled by the great recession. And I think I was impressed, <laughs> basically people didn't come to the public meetings with demands they came with a wish that something would happen. And in a time frame 
that would affect their lives in a positive way. I guess I was struck by the fact that there were no demands as such. There were wishes expressed. They were not unusual wishes. They didn't seem surprising to me. They seemed normal and what you might expect. I think I was impressed with the patience that people had shown in light of the fact that so many previous master planning efforts had come to grief. Um, when it comes to working with the city of Atlanta to change zoning and density and to take advantage of opportunity zones in transit, parentheses, the importance of politics and architecture, what makes that project successful? Do you take more of a Brooks and Scarpa approach to work to inform the cities of what the place should be rather than what it currently is? Well, the reason I started off with Florida is because I was trying to make the point that outsiders very much have this view that they sort of see the way that things could be. And I think they see that in a way that maybe when you live someplace, you're sort of in the weeds a little bit. So yeah, one point I was trying to make was the people who had come to Florida from a distance found it easier to see the way they thought Florida might actually be, what it could be. And so I think sometimes outsiders have a unique advantage in that sense. But I will say of Atlanta, and I think it's important if I wasn't clear about this, that this was a project, the type of project that you spend your entire life preparing for. And I would also consider it to be an ideal project. Like I can't imagine a project that had more issues at stake and involved in it. But we, um, we failed there. And if I wasn't clear about that, what happened is that the master planner, he had his agreement bought out. And because we worked for the master planner, we left the project at the same time that the master planner did. So I wouldn't consider the process um, a success in that regard. I'm proud of the work, but in the end it won't get built. And I don't know what form that project will take in the future. I have a question here from Michael who says, hi, Scott. Um, you once spoke at Notre Dame about how we as architects should think about what's in our nature when we approach design. Can you build on this thought as it relates to the idea of place? I mean, I talk about our nature, the importance of our nature a fair amount, but it has more to do with our um, frailties than it does with you know how it informs what a place should look like. I'm not sure that our natures come into it that much. I'm not sure that I see a tight relationship between the two. Nora has a question, very complex and thoughtful presentation, thank you. Um, who are your partners for stewardship? Do they differ in democratic environments versus autocratic ones, which is easier to navigate? We are often drafting behind DPZ. I mean, historically, I have worked with DPZ in a particular relationship for almost 30 years. And DPZ tends to take the brunt of dealing with people at a distance. And so I have the great luxury of coming in and being able to work on architecture or develop a certain part of a master plan while Andreas or Liz typically are the people who are dealing with the difficulties of the client team or the people that they represent. So I have to say that I'm not that accustomed to having to deal with <laughs> autocratic or democratic regimes. Um, I guess I can say that dealing with democratic places is not that easy. So maybe it's always difficult. Aaron asks, uh, love seeing all the books behind you. Uh, what's a book you find yourself referring to often that you recommend? And then we have a second question that specifically asks, if you could use the moment to show us one book from the shelves behind you, what would it be? A small fraction of the books that we have behind me in this case, I do think it's weird that during COVID, when you watch um, people on news shows, they um, carefully place the books behind them. And it's sort of a fun game to see, you know, if Judy Woodruff is reading the biography of Grant or whatever it may be. And you never know if that's particularly significant or not. We have, at this point, a fairly large library for such a small office. And um, we have a lot of young practitioners who are from Notre Dame, and I encourage them to come back here and to borrow from the library as much as they possibly can. I don't know that there's a limited number of books that I could name that are influential. I think the breadth of what you look at is really important. And as I look around, I would also say that it's not enough to be reading architecture books. You need to read as much as you possibly can, much, much further afield. 
And I think it's just important what you read outside of architecture as what you choose to educate yourself on within architecture. Anonymous question. Um, can you elaborate of the impact of the 2017 tax bill on your master plan? Oh, thank you. I like this. It's a nice targeted question. <laughs> I felt badly during the presentation because I know, I know, I know I went through everything way too fast and I apologize. But the thing that's interesting to me about projects like the Atlanta project is there are so many things that end up affecting it. I didn't even talk about preservation. I did talk about existing and proposed buildings. There are a surprising number of things that come to bear on a complicated project like the Atlanta project. The interesting thing about that is that it was going on while we were involved with it. And I also remember that people took a while to understand the significance of what was in it. And so I think it was Tim Scott, there may have been, Cory Booker may have been involved with it, but Tim Scott, the Senator from South Carolina, I think had put a lot of the language in the Tax Act. The Tax Act was an enormous uh, piece of legislation. And I imagine that the opportunity zones, while it turned out to be important, could well have been a very small part of the Tax Act. But as I said, I think people took a while to understand what the significance of it is, but it gave a lot of people incentive to invest in places. And as I understand the provisions, they allow you to defer or avoid taxes on capital gains. And so if you invest for a certain period of time, I think in 10 years, all your tax liabilities on capital gains can be forgiven. And so something like that becomes an incredible incentive to invest in places that have been designated as opportunity zones. As I also understand it, opportunity zones have been sort of <laughs> established liberally. And so there's a lot of areas that have been considered opportunity zones for reasons that no one maybe really completely understands. And some of them include deserving areas and some of them include less deserving areas. I don't understand completely, but I do understand how small pieces of large legislation can have enormous and sometimes unforeseen impact uh, on development. And the fact that it was unfolding while we were heavily involved in the project made it especially interesting to me. What do you think of modernist efforts to engage with local traditions? I'm thinking of uh, John Nouvelle's recent Louvre Museum in Abu Dhabi, for example. How do you compare your work to his? Not as good. I'm really fond of that museum. I have not seen it. I've only seen photographs of it. But it seems like one of those ideas that's immensely strong and at the same time could be developed in so many different ways. And so it strikes me as a really beautiful idea for a building. I don't know what it's like in execution and I don't know what it's like to try and exhibit art in that building. But just from the outside, the very basic idea, the lighting seems like it's really beautiful. The one thing that I would say about modern versus traditional is that increasingly, I guess I think that the distinctions between the two are not always particularly helpful. And so for example, if you look at Eric and Marianne's work at Alice Beach, this is KVA Architects. They're the town architects at Alice Beach, and they did this building, this extraordinary pool complex and places to eat. It was one of the early public buildings at Alice Beach. And I mentioned the fact that they like North African architecture. And the thing that's interesting about this pool complex is that I think it erases this distinction between modern and traditional buildings. It's almost irrelevant when you look at that pool complex it's very difficult to answer the question whether it's modern or traditional. I mean that in the most complimentary way. And I guess I would also say that the May, which is the building with the shutters on it that we did at Alice Beach, I think I sort of aspired to some of those same qualities, that it was difficult to tell whether it was a modern or traditional building. Um, another question, I truly enjoyed the way that you explained local precedents for your designs. Did the locals in the Middle East easily accept them or were they startled by your use of their own presidents? That is, did they think of you as an interloper? <laughs> I mean, the only conclusion that I came to is that I felt like our presumption to work in other places didn't make us interlopers. That does not to say whether or not we were perceived that way. I mean, the whole theme of the talk basically was this question about, are you an interloper when you go into somebody else's 
uh, country or city, uh, or even in a different region in Florida, I don't know how we were perceived. I do believe in friction. Tom Friedman might think that the world is flat. I don't. I mean, who is the guy who wrote about the revenge of geography? I basically think that geography and culture are almost insurmountably difficult and that the key is to have a partner who's in the place that you're presuming to work. And I think unless you have that, you certainly run the danger of being a bit of an interloper. Next, a very direct question. Can you provide examples of cost per square foot of some of your projects? So recently, I would say within the last 10 years, shelf costs of $100 a square foot are probably on the very low end to which you add um, interior build outs. On the high end, $600 a square foot, depending on where you are. The cost per square foot is going to be a function of a lot of things. The smaller the building is, the harder time you have pushing down the cost per square foot. And also there's a lot of people who simply want to spend more than they absolutely need to. And it's not always the case that the clients wish to push the cost per square foot downward. Another anonymous question, how do you sort out your use of precedent, choosing whether to focus on local, place-based, or more universal? And how much effort do you put into developing that? Well, I think the truth about precedent is that sometimes you go to a project with a store of knowledge about precedents and you draw on that as much as you possibly can. I also think that, you know, you start thinking about a problem and you find more and more examples, even as you're working on it. And so part of it is research and trying to draw from a body of experience and knowledge. And part of it is you know, becoming more attuned to what's actually out there once you start the process. I like the example that I gave um, for the May, which is the shuttered building, because it draws on metal screen building from Los Angeles. It also draws on something from Florida and it draws on something from Madrid. And I think that's a pretty good slide to think about when you think about precedence because Sometimes the precedents actually exist where you're working and sometimes there are really interesting precedents that are far afield. In the case of the precedents for the Seaside Chapel, for example, when I talk about an Episcopal tradition, uh, those are proximate. You know, you can find a lot of examples of Borden Batten chapels in North Florida. But I also think that sometimes you can find really interesting precedents that are far afield that focus in on a particular problem that has nothing to do with the location of the project. Right, we're coming to the last question now. Coming back to building materials, could you please provide an insight into how well the building materials commonly used for projects are aging? Do you think we are facing an issue with building the so-called heritage of the future when we create buildings that lose value because of how the building materials age? Let's divide that up into the expensive buildings that don't age well and the inexpensive buildings that don't age well. Um, This also goes back to that question about, you know, durability and how much can you stand within a given market to invest in good materials. I mean, I think those are two ways of coming at that question. So if you take the cheap buildings, they're usually cheap because they have to be. And yes, we're creating problems. You know, I can't imagine building a condominium out of stick construction. My niece bought one. And I just can't imagine that when a leak occurs and water migrates horizontally, how are you going to pull all that stuff apart? Even expensive buildings, buildings where you can afford to spend a lot more money, nonetheless still fall apart. And part of this is climate related. And part of it is due to stupid stuff like the fact that first growth wood is better than the soft wood that you grow in 20 years. So there's any number of reasons why the quality of construction and materials is not what it should be. And it's just as much the case with expensive buildings as it is with less expensive buildings. It's a universal problem. But I mean, I think up on 30A in the panhandle of Florida, I have seen increasingly people on expensive buildings where they can afford it going to masonry over a lot of wood because wood becomes the problem in a wet climate. That's what fails first on the outside. All right. Well, thank you, Scott. I think that is all the time we have left for questions. And Edith Platten, the Director of Education at the ICAA, um, is just going to say a few words to uh, finish the program. Thank you, Julie. And uh, thank you so much, Scott.
What's a great way to start the week? Thank you again for tuning in and I hope you have a great morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you both.